Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our most significant grand rounds of the year, the Howard Virtual Memorial Lecture. This year is particularly uh, important uh, lecture because this marks the 40th anniversary of the, of the founding of the foundation, Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. And Dr. Burchill, who uh, would, be, would have been 115 years old this year, was uh, an integral part of the foundation of Abbott Northwestern Hospital and of the cardiology practice during the latter one-third of his career. Um, Howard Burchill, or as, as commonly known as Dr. B to us, uh, had the privilege of working with him. Um, wound, found his way to uh, Rochester, Minnesota from Toronto area of Ontario and promptly became a professor of medicine at the Mayo uh, Clinic and uh, brought cardiac catheterization and open heart surgery to that institution in the 40s and 50s. He then um, retired from the Mayo Clinic and became the chief of cardiology at the University of Minnesota and also editor of circulation for several years. And I'm told he would review up to three papers a day uh, for that journal. Um, but mostly Howard was a modest man. He was curious about everything. He loved to wear a bow tie, which you see him here in his home um, in Minneapolis. Um, and if you look to the side, you would see a whole stack of journals of circulation and journal of the American College of Cardiology and his fireplace. And um, Howard seemed to know what was going on in terms of everyone in this institution's interest in cardiology. And he, you could always find him in the library. He, ha he, would, uh, he was the original Twitterer. He would write little short handwritten notes to everyone. And, and it would just be little comments, humble criticisms, often starting out with, have, have you considered this in, in terms of what your particular work was? He had a, um, a voice that sounded like it always needed a shot of WD-40. And he um, was, uh, um, he, lo he loved Digitalis and the foxglove plant. He had a keen interest in that. He was a world traveler and, and known to all of cardiologists at the time. And he once nominated Dr. Dirk Durer, the, the eminent electrophysiologist from the Netherlands, for a Nobel Prize in medicine. And he didn't, uh, he, that was not um, granted, but uh, Howard did. That was Howard's style, always about some, someone else. So we're particularly proud of our legacy with Dr. Birchall. And uh, before I turn the podium over to, to Dr. Bennett to introduce Dr. Yancey, I will ask John to show us who the past Birchall lecturers have been since 2010. Dr. Bernie Gersh from the Mayo Clinic. In 2012, Dr. David Holmes from the Mayo Clinic. 2013, Dick Asinger from Hennepin County. 2016 was Carl Papine. 2017, Robert Harrington. 2018, Anne-Marie Valente. 2019, Navin Kapoor. And then last year, Dr. Matthew Maurer. And this year, we're really privileged to have Dr. Clyde Yancey, who I know is uh, up and at him, uh, down in Chicago and waiting to be introduced by my colleague and partner, Dr. Mosey Bennett. Mosey? Thanks, Scott. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us um, for this very special Grand Rounds. We have a truly wonderful guest this morning, a true giant of cardiovascular medicine. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Clyde Yancey. Dr. Yancey's talk this morning is entitled, Heart Failure, A New Coming of Age for an Old Disease. It really would take a full hour to go through in detail all of Dr. Yancey's uh, career achievements and accolades. So in the interest of time, I can't mention them all. He's, Dr. Yancey is the Vice Dean of Diversity and Inclusion, the Chief of Cardiology, and the Magerstadt Endowed Professor of Medicine and Cardiology at Northwestern University School of Medicine. He's a native of Louisiana. He went to Southern University for undergrad and Tulane University for med school. He trained in cardiology at UT Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. 
Of note, Dr. Yancey trained in advanced heart failure and transplant with MHI's very own Dr. Maria Olivari. Dr. Yancey's research interests are heart failure, clinical guideline generation, outcomes, sciences, personalized medicine, and healthcare disparities. He's published well over 600 peer-reviewed publications and is one of the most highly cited scientific authors worldwide. He has served on many clinical practice guidelines and consensus statements, writing committees. He is a former president of the AHA. He's completed extensive government service for the NIH and FDA. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and the American Association of Physicians. On a personal note, I was fortunate to meet Dr. Yancey when I was a cardiology fellow, just starting my own career in, in heart failure, and he's been a mentor and a role model for well over the past 12 years. We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Yancey and look forward to an exciting talk. Well, good morning to all of my colleagues in Minneapolis, and thank you so much for this really incredible invitation to honor someone who really is one of the standard bearers of cardiovascular medicine. I took some time to read the biography of Dr. Burchell before even preparing for this presentation. And whenever one comes across someone who laid the foundation for who we are today and how we pursue our work today, one has to pause and pay homage because we really do build our careers on the legacy of those persons that were pioneers that really were the first ones to take the big steps that have allowed us to subsequently take future steps. So I truly am humbled to be able to present to you today in memory of one of the standard bearers of cardiovascular medicine. And I smiled when the introduction of uh, the namesake for this lecture identified him as the original Twitterer. And um, even more so when um, I heard of his work ethic, his passion for bow ties and his just <clears throat> unrelenting support of others. Those really are traits of leadership and clearly you've been touched by a leader in cardiovascular medicine. Mosey, thank you for your kind words. <clears throat> it's been my pleasure to align with you, mentor you and nurture you over more than a decade and I continue to see great things in your future. And if Dr. Oliveri is anywhere within the vicinity, let me give her a very warm good morning. I spent time with her between 1990 and 91 and lessons that she taught me then I still use now. So a special good morning to Dr. Oliveri if she is involved at all this morning. So let's begin. We're talking about heart failure and we're talking about a coming of age for an old disease. I have no relevant disclosures, but I will review the most recently released guidelines within the last 10 days, in fact. And I'm the senior sitting member of that guideline writing committee, former chair of that group for nine years. So that is my only relevant disclosure. So what's the objective? Let's think about how heart failure care has evolved from the past to the future. Let's discuss a new definition of heart failure, discuss the current treatment paradigm. How do we get to quadruple therapy? And if time permits, we'll talk about subgroups, but I particularly want to talk about the new guidelines. So let's start with the old era. Heart failure has been around for centuries. Again, I smiled when you talked of Dr. Burchell's affection for digitalis of foxglove. As a medical student, I had the opportunity once to run with George Birch. And for Dr. Birch, it was digitalis leaf. And so there are many people amongst us who have thought about heart failure in the era of digitalis. In that old era, think about what wasn't available. And now let's define that old era as just 10 years ago just 10 years ago, 10 years ago, we didn't have the RNA compound. We didn't have a Vebridine. We didn't even contemplate the use of a diabetic agent that would help the heart. We were aware of anti-diabetic agents, hypoglycemic agents that might harm the heart. We did not have available to for our practice quantum cyclase activators. We had not envisioned omocamptive macarbal, a myotope, we were not giving intravenous ferrous carboxymaltose for iron deficiency as a means of helping heart failure. You heard from Dr. Mara, we didn't have tofaminus just 10 years ago. Mavicamptin, 
a drug that's pending before the FDA as the first medical treatment for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy hadn't been invented. And we're just now at the anniversary for the transcapsular therapies, but they were still experimental 10 years ago. And so now we have this entire compartment of new therapeutics in just the last 10 to 12 years. Where are we going? Well, we're still missing the right emphasis on diversity in clinical trials. We're still missing the full incorporation of women with heart failure. I'll call your attention to a review article that we just published last week in Jack with my young star colleague, Sadia Khan, identifying women with heart failure and all of the perturbations and physiology that that entails. And then health equity was not part of our vernacular, not part of our conversation 10 years ago, yet it has to be now. Beyond that, we hadn't begun to think about value, and I'll have some very specific comments about value of care as we go on this morning. The electronic health record had been introduced, but it wasn't nearly the platform it is today. And the whole concept of data science had not evolved. So I want you to pause with me. I know it's early in the morning for all of us, but pause and realize that as we talk about the coming of age of heart failure, and we revisit where we've been, where we've come, and what's still left to go. This has been an exciting time. Any of us that have followed this field, we really have been stunned with all the developments, all of the therapeutics, all of the issues, everything that now populates the conversation about heart failure. Now, let's start at the very beginning. What's the definition of heart failure? Many of us know this very elegant definition that reads, any condition where the heart is incapable of providing the metabolic needs of the body. It's a beautiful definition. It makes good prose, but it's very hard to measure. So a group of us came together in 2020 as leaders of the individual heart failure societies internationally and decided to reconcile this definition into something that was actionable. That was published one year ago. But once again, as we reconcile the definition, we did in fact partition heart failure according to ejection fraction. That's not novel. Heart failure with reduced DF is as it was before. Heart failure with preserved DF is as it was before with the numerical partitions. But the two things that are different refer to heart failure with ejection fractions between 41 and 49 inclusively, specifically heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction thinking that these numbers are not a fluke, that there's a real phenomenon, a phenotype, where the ventricular function is measured between 41 and 49. And what is most intriguing was this specific phenotype of heart failure with improved DF, meaning that previously the ejection fraction was less than 40%, and corresponding with the administration of evidence-based device and drug therapy, there was a greater than 10-point increase, and that subsequent measure was greater than 40%. Now that's a lot of words for a definition, but I want you to pause and think about what that means. That means that something occurred where a ventricle that was terribly impaired after exposure to evidence-based therapies had a very robust response. That means that something changed in the biology. That should excite you. The young scientists in the audience, the curious in the audience should say, why is that? How can a ventricle go from 28 to 45? or 19 to 41, or 18 to 48. Something occurred biologically, and if we could harness that, that would make a big difference. So now the new definition requires signs and symptoms of heart failure, that's not novel, that must be associated with either structural or functional cardiac abnormality as a requirement, but then what is measurable about this definition is that that constellation of signs, symptoms, structural and functional abnormalities must be corroborated by evidence of congestion, either elevated natriuretic peptide levels or an objective parameter that's consistent with pulmonary systemic congestion. The takeaways, symptoms and signs, objective evidence of heart disease, and objective evidence of congestion. This is a very different definition and allows us to actually measure those traits for the patients that have heart failure, but most importantly, it allows us to say who doesn't have heart failure. When you think about the heft of that term, being able to rule out heart failure, if we will, based on this definition, 
becomes quite important. So if I take the usual template that identifies the stages of heart failure, I just want you to focus on one thing, focus on the purple arrow. It says, what's new? What's new is that for years, me and many others have said the progression from one stage to the next that is going from left to right is inviolate, meaning that once you've left the stage, you cannot return to that stage. What's stunningly new is that we're making the really impassioned argument that for some people with heart failure in stage C, at risk for progressing to stage D, in fact, after exposure to guideline-directed management and risk factor modification, the progression of heart failure halts. We call that heart failure in remission. It is ripe for more discovery, but if we can figure out how we can effectuate that biologically, we can once again radically change the natural history. So what is the current paradigm? This is the template that we put together in 2013 that builds on the template that we had available in 2003, the template that we replicated again in 2016, 2017, but in, in essence, it divides heart failure into four stages, two that are at risk, two that have the disease, stage A, risk factors only, stage B, structural heart disease with no symptoms, stage C is now bifurcated to have PEF and have REF, this is the first time that ever happened, and in stage D, advanced disease despite appropriate therapies. And if you pay attention to the lower tier of boxes, embedded in each box, is the evidence-based regimen that's indicated for that stage. So that really has been the way in which we think about heart failure, study heart failure. That's been current up until just 10 days ago. As well, in 2016, we created this algorithm and identified the several steps needed. There may be some residents in the audience, so let's be very clear. You make the diagnosis after you take a picture. You cannot guess ejection fraction. Once you've qualify that this is heart failure and you know the ejection fraction, then for reduced D of heart failure, you start RAS inhibition and an evidence-based beta blocker with diuretics as needed. And then you go through one of these six interrogatories. Each of these interrogatories prompts a specific therapy that gives you what we would call a semi-personalized approach for heart failure for that patient with reduced DF. And only when symptoms persist after going through this, do you go to step four and five which is appropriate for more advanced disease. And we've empowered this with an app called the Treat HF app. It's available in the app store, it's available on Google Play, but you should be able to download this in less than minutes and use it at the bedside for all of your patients. Just like the ASCVD risk indicator, you answer a few questions about your patient. These prompts then effectuate, produce for you the semi-personalized medical regimen for your patient, along with links establishing a database. So we really felt like we had something referable. We had a reasonable template and we had an excellent tool to establish therapy for reduced DF heart failure. And we had as best as we could through 2017, steps that we could take to approach FPEF, understanding we had no strongly indicated medical therapy, but we had at least some inclinations that an aldosterone antagonist might be beneficial. Not that it was, but it might be beneficial. So that was the state of the art through 2019, 2020, when we began the deliberations about developing a new guideline. What really prompted a lot of that deliberative thought was the availability of a new potent and powerful drug class, the SGLT2 inhibitors. Let me make an argument right now, again, for the early career physicians in the room. If you have graduated from medical school within the last five years, this is a comment for you. I want you to envision the impact of the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors akin to the impact the statin therapy brought along when I was at your age, that is within five years of my medical graduation. We believe these drugs are that potent. The story is incredible. I won't belabor the story other than to say because of the history of glucose lowering agents leading to cardiac morbidity, if not mortality, there was a requirement put in place about 12 years ago by the FDA. If you wanted to bring forward a new hypoglycemic agent, you had to explicitly demonstrate 
that it had a null effect on cardiovascular outcomes, that it was safe. Well, unbeknownst to anyone, the first drug to go through this litmus test was the flogan, the flozins, in this case, empagliflozin. And remarkably, not only was it safe, but it looked like there was evidence of benefit, particularly on hospitalizations for heart failure. That went on to a consistent signal through every drug in that class under active consideration. This meta-analysis put together by my friend and colleague at the Brigham Mark Sabatine was published in January of 2019, but it demonstrated that from pagliflozin, canagliflozin, and dipagliflozin, all three drugs, whether patients had established atherosclerotic disease or simply risk factors, the introduction of the SGLT2 inhibitors, three different ones, consistently, consistently reduce the risk of heart failure. This is a stunning outcome, so much so that immediately multiple hypotheses arise. Specifically, if it's that effective at preventing the disease, what about treating the disease? So I credit my colleague in the UK, John McMurray, for coming forward with DAPA-HF. On top of evidence-based therapy, what John and colleagues demonstrated was a consistent and strong signal of a reduction in important clinical outcomes. The primary outcome, which was a composite of death from cardiovascular causes and hospitalization for heart failure, then each of the individual composites, but remarkably death from any cause. That's the most difficult endpoint to reach in a clinical trial. And this portfolio of outcomes were all positive. But there was one other thing that John did he recruited patients with both diabetes and without, arguing, is it necessary to have diabetes for these drugs to work? That was a brilliant concept, and it left us with a remarkable observation. Independent of the presence of diabetes, these drugs work and work in a very compelling way. So we're at a point now where everything changed. We now had this drug class that demonstrated a unique benefit, independent of the presence of diabetes, and a benefit that was on top of what we already thought was evidence-based therapy. What we then understood was that the benefit was not slight. If you look at the time to benefit, and this was published in JAMA Cardiology, the journal for which I serve as deputy editor, and we were delighted to see these data, within 30 days, within 30 days, the endpoint is already statistically important for worsening heart failure, cardiovascular death, and well within the first three months, one has clear evidence that patients are already reaping a benefit from being on these agents. Really makes the argument for starting these agents early because the benefit is almost immediate. Let's take our frame from HEFREF, understanding that just based on that very powerful set of observations, there was a requirement to revisit the guidelines. What about HEFPEF? Well, once again, the SGLT2 inhibitors emerge. This single author editorial several months ago in the European Heart Journal by none other than Dr. Bronwall really made the argument that as you go back into the 19th century and read the classic work of physiologists where they literally dismiss diastole, we've now come full circle and with the results of the Emperor Preserve trial, truly have the first randomized control trial, again, using a flozin, in this case, empagliflozin to demonstrate a reduction in the composite of cardiovascular death and hospitalization, driven almost entirely by a reduction in the need for hospitalization, but now a strongly supported single intervention for patients with HEFPEF. So this really got us to the point where we've got a new way of thinking about this. It's empowered with animal data that demonstrated the potential benefit, and then it was supported by these emperor preserve trial data points, a very straightforward design with a very positive outcome as you see here. Hospitalizations uniquely drove that outcome. So we still don't have something vis-a-vis -vis mortality, but for morbidity, it's there. I put together this summary statement just to remind you that for this group of drugs that I'm arguing will eventually have the same benefit on human health as statins. There is an indication for HEF-REF, that red line not currently supported as of what I'm about to show you will be supported. HEF-PEF, 
for hospitalized heart failure and even for heart failure and chronic renal disease. In all four categories, this drug class has incredible information that supports a new way of practice. We began to think about this in a group for which I once again served as senior author. This was the ACC Expert Concision to Path Decision Pathway Group for Optimization of Health for Therapies. We had led the publication in 2017, 2021, we revisited this, and specifically, specifically, we made the argument then that RAS inhibition should preferentially be the RNA compound. We have the same interrogatories, but what's important is that we've added the SLT2 inhibitor, and you see the purple arrow. And so we're making a case again that for those patients meeting requirements, specifically GFR requirements, this is a brand new therapy, but this doesn't have the power of guidelines, but it does have the power of thought and suggestion. And we were trying to incline the community to think about heart failure in a new way. Our colleagues in Europe released their ESC heart failure guidelines in late summer 2021. Here, they began to think about half ref and half PEF, but also heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction similar to the definition I've given you, but they went through the data and identified a number of therapeutics for which there is at least some evidence that there might be benefit for heart failure with mid-range EF. But just to see how fast this field is moving, these data points are released in August of 2021. HEFPEF still didn't have a specific drug indication for the ESC guidelines. HEFREF, of course, had what you might expect. They did share with us a very interesting and straightforward algorithm way of thinking about this. This is the introduction, if you will, of quadruple therapy, RAS inhibition, evidence-based beta blocker, MRA, and aflosin. I've said that three times already, and I really want to embed that in the mindset of the younger physicians listening. We now have a new drug class of aflosins appropriate for cardiovascular disease, in this case, heart failure. But what I also like about this algorithm is that it further differentiates therapy according to the indication for devices. And if you're watching this carefully, you will see something that is as appearing for the first time, that is downgrading the IC to a class 2A in the non-ischemic patient. This is the European guideline. The American guideline has not done that, but it's a very provocative argument. So take a look at this algorithm and think about this as yet another way to schematize how to approach the patient with heart failure. That gets me to where I want to be with you and we're right on time. I want to introduce to you the new heart failure guidelines from the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology and the Heart Failure Society of America all working jointly. You're the first audience with whom I've had a chance to vet these new guidelines. So I'll appreciate your feedback on the information that's provided. At the very end, I'll tell you why that feedback is so important. So let's start with the epidemiology of heart failure as stated in the new guidelines. You can see there's been an increase in heart failure related deaths, an increase in heart failure hospitalization, but a decline in the incidence, an incidence uniquely in HEF-REF, but an increasing incidence in HEF-PEF. It's a lot of epidemiology in just three statements. A unique highlight here is a differential influence of that epidemiology. Remember one of the objectives was to talk about heart failures that affects different populations. Those persons that self-identify as Black or African-American have a much higher age-adjusted mortality rate than all others. And so there remain evident disparities. It's a function of race and ethnicity, thinking about persons that are Hispanic that requires further assessment. And so we should understand this as we continue to go forward. And what about the stages? Well, there's stage A, not dissimilar from what I described before, persons at risk. Stage B, this is slightly different because it's those persons with evidence of heart disease, but that evidence can also include increased nitritic peptide levels, increased cardiac troponin, and the absence of a competing diagnosis, that is. And so we've refined stage B to say it's not just asymptomatic heart disease, but with concomitant increase in biomarkers. That takes us to stage C, which is patients with current or previous disease, 
and in stage D, persistent symptoms despite being on a program of medical therapy. Stage C is a workhorse. In stage C, we see this trajectory where it starts as new onset. It can either lead to resolution of symptoms, thinking about heart failure remission. It can be persistent, staying at stage C, indicated for those therapies, or it can be worsening heart failure going to stage D. So that whole concept of there being an inviolate nature going from one stage to the next has to be refined yet again, because it's at stage C where multiple different trajectories are possible. And this again is new content. What's the diagnostic algorithm? Again, this is for all of us. Think about the new definition, looking for signs and symptoms, laboratory data, ECG, and then look at the naturopathic peptides. If they're elevated, those two requirements establish the definition, particularly when the transthoracic echo shows evidence of structural and functional heart disease. Once the diagnosis is confirmed, one has to look at precipitating factors, initiate treatment, and undergo serial self-assessment. But in this space of naturopathic peptides, we want to be very thoughtful about how we consider the condition, and we also want to be very careful with our assessment of ejection fraction, realizing that there is HEF-REF that has unique outcomes, meaning it can go to health field with improved EF. There's mid-range ejection fraction, which typically can go in one of three routes, and then there's HEF-PEF, HEF -PEF, which can go one of three routes as well. One of the things that we understand is that for patients that have experienced improved ejection fraction heart failure, we really are wedded to those medical therapies. We have no evidence-based data to suggest that we should remove information. In fact, we have evidence-based data from TRADHF that that would be harmful. What about causes of heart failure? Well, the risk factors are prototypical as they've always been, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease being one of the main precipitants. But what about the non-ischemic causes? You can see the portfolio of therapies here. Many of us forget about substance abuse and stress cardiomyopathy. Those are very real causes. Our colleagues in the electrophysiology world frequently remind us of heart rhythm related causes of heart failure. We should keep that in mind. So what about the initial evaluation? Well, one has to be very thoughtful and take a very, very careful history, including a multi-generational family history. For the laboratory and ECG, it's class one recommendation. That means indicated, not maybe, not kind of, but truly indicated. And we can see the usual baseline laboratory data are important, totally ECG is important. What about the biomarkers? I told you that I would get back to this. For patients with dyspnea, it's a class one indication to use the biomarkers to determine the etiology of the dyspnea. Dyspnea plus elevated natriuretic peptide levels really inclines us to think about heart failure. In patients at risk for heart failure, an elevated natriuretic peptide level allows us to intervene early with evidence-based therapies that may halt the progression. And we know this from the STOP HF data. What about patients hospitalized for heart failure? Strong recommendation to obtain the natriuretic peptide levels at admission to help understand prognosis. A reasonable recommendation to get a natriuretic peptide level pre-discharge to understand the trajectory after discharge. And then what about for chronic HF? Again, helps us understand risk stratification. So I would make the argument that for those of us that are clinically active, these natriuretic peptide levels partitioned in one of these four categories ends up being important. And as you see in the reminder box, pay careful attention to other causes of elevation. What about imaging? Chest X-ray is obligatory. That's class one. How many of you have looked at a chest X-ray lately? It's a class one indication in patients with suspected heart failure. Transthoracic echo at baseline for newly diagnosed heart failure, class one recommendation, meaning it must be done. For cardiac CT, CMR, SPEC, and PET, in those in whom echo is inadequate, guess what? This is a class one recommendation. If there's been a significant change, if you're considering an invasive procedure, this is a class one recommendation. And for those where you suspect a cardiomyopathy, it's a class two A recommendation.
for ischemia in patients with a high pretest likelihood as a class 2A, but routine serial assessment using any antigen platform is class 3, no benefit. What about invasive evaluations? Invasive evaluations, angiography, and biopsy are the two that are most important. There's a 2A for those patients in whom hemodynamic assessment might be helpful in guiding management. There's a 2A for those in whom biopsy might determine an outcome that would change the approach. Cardiac angiography is indicated, again, based on pretest likelihood and particularly with the presence of angina. For initial and serial evaluation, wearable and remote monitoring has an indication. This is an implantable PA monitor. You can see the scenario on the left side of the screen. Exercise and functional capacity is a class one. This is an indicated and supported adjunct to evidence-based therapy, terribly undersubscribed. We've published that indicated patients who could receive cardiac rehab and are receiving it is about 5% of the population. So this is where we really fall short. And then what about heart failure risk scoring? I want you to think very carefully about what I'm sharing with you right now. Heart failure risk scoring allows us to understand who's likely to have disease, particularly for those people at risk. For those that are acutely decompensated, there are a number of risk scoring assessments. The ADHERE classification and regression tree model was developed by my colleagues and I in 2005, published in JAMA. It's still effective. What about for chronic heart failure? There are any number of these risk scores, the Seattle Heart Failure Score, the MAGIC Score, the CHARM Risk Score. For HEFPEF specifically, the iPreserve and Tomcat. This is a lot of information, but it tells you that we've taken a lot of time to understand how to better discriminate whom it is that has heart failure and what their outcomes might be. And looking for HEFREF specific, again, Paradigm HF guided, we have a number of very effective scores. What about recommendations? So this is where it becomes very important. Let's pause for a moment and think about where we've gone. We've talked about stages. We've talked about exciting new therapies. Let's talk about where the new guidelines are in terms of recommendations for therapy. For those at risk for heart failure, that means risk factors are present and this is primary prevention. You want to halt the progression of symptoms for hypertension, for diabetes, for known cardiovascular disease, for exposure to cardiotoxic agents, for inherited cardiomyopathies, you can see there are a number of interventions appropriate for changing that natural history. For those that have established left ventricular dysfunction with elevated nitrotic peptides, and now we're in stage B and we wanna prevent the clinical syndrome, we have an indication for ACE inhibitors for ARBs, a base intolerant, for beta blockers, even for ICDs, for genetic counseling, in fact, for those that have positive family histories and already have asymptomatic LV dysfunction. This is work digesting. This is incredibly important, and everything is supported by a consistent recommendation for lifestyle modification. What about HEFREF stages C and D? This will be familiar. Step one, establish the diagnosis and you work through the different interrogatories and you end up with quadruple therapy, SGLT2 inhibitor, MRA, beta blocker, evidence-based, and RAS inhibition. Why do I say you work through the interrogatories? Because you remember that both the MRA and the SGLT2 inhibitor have renal function thresholds. For the beta blocker, it's got to be the evidence-based beta blocker. Preferentially, the RNA compound is indicated, but the ACE and ARB are suitable. Step two is titrate. Give patients reasonable doses of these therapies as tolerated. Identify this partition, heart failure with improved EF after being exposed to these evidence-based therapies. We've talked about what that means. That goes straight to continued reassessment or heart failure with reduced injection fraction is persistent. That gets us to step three. Here, we're thinking about additional other therapies like nitrates and hydrolyzing for African-American patients. You can see we're thinking about ICDs and CRT as device indications. At step four, we consider additional other therapies, therapies that are not class one indication, but therapies that may work in particular, thyrosaquat, 
on the campus as it becomes available. And only then do we get to stage step five, which is identifying those patients that either improve and can go into serial follow-up, those that have refractory heart failure. Time permitting, we could talk about therapies there, but you understand mechanical circular sore support and cardiac transplantation being appropriate there. I told you I would make a very important highlight. For the first time ever, first time ever, we were able to look at indicated therapies and make a companion value statement about those therapies. Value being, are the outcomes favorable and what's the cost? And high value would mean low cost with favorable outcomes. So you can see value statements for the RNA ACE, for the MRA, for the beta blocker, even for the SGLT2 inhibitor, though expensive, the benefits are so profound that the value statement says intermediate at least. For the other agents, the value statement says high. For African-Americans with a combination of nitrates and hydralazine, the value statement is high. It's affordable. The benefit is profound in those patients. The level of evidence is cited. It's the first time we've ever had an opportunity to really prompt these statements about value. And almost assuredly, patients will see this and will raise questions about the value of their different therapeutics. What about device statements? ICD, high value, high benefit, reasonable cost. CRT, there's still some finessing of who gets the most benefit. So it's a high value, but be non-randomized data to get us there. What about the additional other therapies? Evabridine, Virasiguat. We aren't yet at a point we can put Bavacamptin in because it's for HCM or put Omicamptivin but those drugs are under FDA review. Here comes the Joxin again, thinking about Dr. Burchell. Still a 2B indication. Many of us don't use it anymore, but still a 2B indication. And polyunsaturated fatty acids, and for a unique group at risk for hyperkalemia, the potassium binder, still waiting for good clinical outcome information in this group. Here's an algorithm for patients with cardiomyopathy or HEFREF, where we're thinking about CRT recommendations. You can see how this comes together, primarily driven by the width of the QRS. There are spatial circumstances where one has to think about RV pacing. This usually is in a set of atrial fibrillation, but this is really nicely identified. We can also see that there are additional device therapies or interventions to be considered after GDMT optimization, surgical revascularization for coronary disease, transcatheter therapies for severe secondary MR, edge, edge repair for secondary MR, and you can see wireless PA catheter placement. For secondary MR, you can see this very informative algorithm that gets us either to mitral valve surgery or transcatheter edge to edge mitral valve repair. Recommendations for patients with mild reduced, this is an at mid range. You can see there's an indication across the board for the therapeutics, class one recommendation using guideline directed medical therapy. For HEFPEF, this is the first time we've had anything that looks like this with indications for diuretics, class one, SGLT2 inhibitors, 2A, then the RNA compound, the MRA, and the ARB, 2B. Cardiac amyloidosis, we've made mention and reference to this. You've heard these data in a previous Burchell lecture, but suffice it to say, this is low value because of the cost of tefaminous, but it's breakthrough because for the first time we're able to treat a condition that was otherwise fatal. There's quite a bit of information when we think about amyloid, and we should really take our time and work through AL versus TTR, understanding the importance of gene sequencing, understanding the importance of our therapeutics. You start with light chains. Light chains, if they're present, can proceed with a cohesion power phosphate scan, and you can stop right there if that's positive. Um, biopsies are not obligatory, but certainly if the technetium pyrophosphate scan is negative, but the clinical screen is positive and the light chains are present, by all means, a biopsy is required. What about advanced therapy? This is an iteration of something that came forward in our consensus decision pathway statements in 2017, the I need help algorithm. You can see this is beautifully portrayed here. Each letter basically is, is an acronym. 
and it helps us identify when we should refer patients on for additional care. You might have seen the sodium HF trial presented by our colleague Justin Zekowitz out of Canada, demonstrating no difference in clinical outcomes in patients randomized to a low sodium diet versus a normal diet of sodium, but even their normal diet was lower than in the US. But nevertheless, the only positive sign was a quality of life indication. So we remain really confounded by what's the right statement when we think about patients who have heart failure and we're talking about sodium restriction. You can see here, we say the benefit of fluid restriction, the benefit of sodium restriction, both of these are uncertain. For decompensation, there are any number of things that are important here. Look for precipitating causes, make certain we take advantage of the hospitalization moment to optimize therapy. We do that by looking at where there are admission, optimizing therapy during the care in a hospital, but particularly at the time of pre-discharge, it's so important to think this through. When we're thinking of decongestion, we have to use loop diuretics as carefully as possible. You can see again from my early career physicians, take whatever dose a patient is on who comes in decompensated, double that diuretic dose and give it every eight or 12 hours. Fairly aggressive, but that is exactly the right way to do this. If we continue to think about what else we do for a hospitalized patient, clearly there are those with shock. This is nicely articulated in the guidelines. Transition of care should be seamless with follow-up within the first seven days. Participation in quality of care programs works very well. We should have patients on flexible diuretic regimens so we can avoid renal insufficiency, but this transition of care plan is incredibly important. So in terms of concomitant other comorbidities, think about iron deficiency, think about sleep disorders, think about diabetes, and think about hypertension. Atrial fibrillation has its own constellation of recommendations in setting a heart failure, and then the vulnerable populations, getting back to something I promised you in the very beginning. The vulnerable population is a whole cascade of patients, and we have to think carefully about the unique circumstances that each patient brings before us, we should be constantly aware of evidence of health disparities and assiduous to look for ways that we can improve health equity. There are any number of concepts about cardio-oncology that have been articulated in our guidelines. They are available for your review. The same thing for heart failure in pregnancy. These statements are available for your review. There are performance measures that we should follow, particularly for your inpatient services. These are adjudicated and are the basis upon which you or assess as for the quality of care you provide. Goals of care, I can't begin to tell you how important this is. Our patients come to us and we're providing therapies, but we need to pause at some point and go through the goals of care. Look what the class one recommendations are for all patients. Let me emphasize that again, for all patients with heart failure, it's important to have the discussion about palliation and supportive care. And for all patients being considered for life extending therapies, there should be an anticipatory pre-intervention discussion about the extent of how far you want to go and who will be supportive and what criteria would apply for discontinuation. I think these are very important statements. We can't forget the importance of quality of life. We have new tools to assess quality of life, particularly the Kansas City questionnaire. It gives us an opportunity to understand how patients are responding. We believe that as time goes forward, some agents will be approved based on the ability to modify quality of life. There are evidence gaps that we have to consider in this whole space. I've shared with you a lot of very specific information. I've shared with you prompts to see other data sources that are within the guidelines. But even despite everything I'll share with you this morning, look at all of the areas where we still need more data, particularly with the social determinants of health. That's incredibly important. Additional comorbidity data, future novel therapies, all of these are very, very important. Now, I told you at the beginning, I would explain to you why the feedback on this statement about the new guidelines was, would be so important.
That's because we went through a different process. We had a different group of individuals <laughs> helping us put together the PowerPoint representation under the guidance of former AHA President Dr. Elliot Antman. The goal being to have information that was accessible, that was clear, that really made the case of what it is we're trying to convey. So you are one of the first audiences to see this new iteration of the guidelines. Maybe in the chat, you can tell me how these bill slides and PowerPoint information was able to amplify or make clear what we articulated in the guidelines. So for my last bit of information with you, I'm going to give you my view for the next 10 years. Over the next 10 years, I think we need to embrace implementation science. Use behavioral economics as a way of nudging best therapies. Think about machine learning and data science using the EHR platforms to drive quality of care. I think we need to go to some disruptive strategies that is a polypill, very inexpensive, that compartmentalizes all of the indicated therapies for HEFREF and use it as a single agent, taken once or twice a day for best outcomes in heart failure. We have a candidate agent that we're testing now in a lower middle income country as we speak. If that's important, we will bring it to the US and begin to test it initially in at-risk populations. We're developing a polydiuretic, again, colleagues of mine here at Northwestern, specifically for PEF-PEF, polydiuretic, meaning an SGLT2 inhibitor, a loop diuretic, and an MRA. Our polypill has candesartan, long-acting carvedilol, an MRA, and as an SGLT2 inhibitor becomes available, we'll go back to the compound pharmacy and add that. But I'm really excited about these two iterations of polypills that we're uniquely developing here at Northwestern because I believe this is a way that we can improve adherence to evidence-based therapies. What about breakthrough science? Well, we're just beginning to see the benefit of small interfering RNA compounds. Think about the data that just emerged at ACC for the first time, looking at therapies targeting LP little a, small interfering RNA compounds. We need to understand something that helps us become more precise with LVF measurement. It may be global longitudinal strain from the echo lab, it may be extracellular volume. It may be additional other factors from the MRI suite, but we need something to supplant the LVF measurement. Personalized care, I used that term early on, just about looking at the indicated therapies for heart failure. That's fairly crude. We need to become more precise with proteomics, with genomics and biomarkers so that we only give patients therapies from which they're likely to receive a benefit but prevention is huge. Anything we can do to halt the progression from asymptomatic, free of heart disease to having heart failure would be profoundly important. And then the final thing I'll share with you, which gets back to the beginning, we must be ever present, ever thoughtful about health equity. I wanna thank you so much for this opportunity to give the virtual lecture. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to be one of the first audiences with whom I've shared our current ACC age HFSA heart failure guidelines. I wanna thank all of you for being a trial population to let me know how this new development of our companion representation materials work. But most importantly, I wanna thank all of you for having an interest in this condition that I've been studying for over 30 years. It is an important condition. It makes a difference in the lives of our patients. If we can all continue to work collaboratively with our research first, and then with our clinical practice, we can make a difference in the lives of patients with heart failure. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. That was excellent. It was a really unique opportunity to hear uh, the, about the new guidelines from, from the experts. So thank you for that. Um, I see I think, two questions that are here. So let me acknowledge uh, Dr. Alberry. Thank you for being in the room and uh, thank you for your kind words. Um, for Dr. Sun, whom I also know, um, Ben, the methodology that we use is akin to a Markov model, um, not a rigid cost effective analysis for each agent. But surprisingly, there is quite a bit of information published on cost-effective analyses on many of the newer agents, and we've evaluated that information critically. 
because as you know, everything is predicated on what we know as quality. The cost, the quality adjusted life year, the cost per quality adjusted life year, and there are metrics that we accept that approximate the cost of dialysis in some areas, which would be $50,000 per quality. But some have argued that for contemporary medicine, that number needs to go up to 100,000. So it wasn't just a guess. I mean, it could be argued that someone just made an assessment of this as a lot of benefit and reasonable cost. But no, we actually went through the data, most of the data again using Markov models based on qualities to determine where do we meet these thresholds, somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000. At 50,000, that's high value. At 100,000, that would be intermediate value. So thank you for that question, Ben. Uh, Jancy, I think we have a question um, here in the, in the room. Sure. Uh, hi, Clyde. It's great to see you, uh, even though virtually, um, and really enjoy your, your talk. Um, I wanted to, you know, uh, have your expand, please, on that last slide on the implementation. So great knowledge has been generated, and the guidelines are very clear. Um, should there be a guidelines on how to implement? Can we learn best practices from each other? Um, how can we move uh, the inertia and, and what have we learned so far on how to implement? So such a profound question because um, the truth of the matter is yes, there should be some guideline statement on what works for implementation, what doesn't. We know this, and this is sobering. Prior to the contemporary era, with the introduction of each new therapeutic for heart failure, even for other cardiovascular conditions, from the point of evidence to genuine uptake driven by guidelines with proof of high subscription, 17 years, 17 years, we don't have that luxury anymore. Patients have diseases and we can't allow patients to wait that long before they're exposed to evidence-based therapies. That's why we're trying to identify first implementation scientists, because we need to rigorously test the mode of implementation, just like we've tested the agents that we're implementing. Is it best if you use a nudge with a social media platform or with a smart technology? We've recognized that the nudges work, but when you try to make them bi-directional, there is a reluctance to interface with a machine or with a website. And so we've learned that process. What about reminders? What about patient navigators? Both of those are implementation strategies. Reminders seem to work, but there can't be a constant flow. Navigators may work, but surprisingly, the evidence has not yet been overwhelming. Perhaps for advanced disease, the navigators will work. And then of course there's economics, but we've learned that even when you give medicines away, patients are particularly reluctant. Why is this free? and I'm not willing to follow suit. So it's a phenomenal sphere of science and it's not intuitive. The things that you thought would work, getting the text message, having the medicine given to you free, having a person assigned to coach you through requires an evidence-based rigorous testing. So this is yet another frontier of science so we can understand what really works best. It's one reason why we're so invested in developing the polypill because maybe the great impediment to implementation is the fact that right now, there are nine indicated therapies for HFREF, nine. Nobody's gonna take nine therapies, just, just not gonna happen. But if we can show that a poly pill works, that might change everything. So really a great question and it's worth our additional study. Look, there are two other questions in the chat that I want to address. One is which patient is not an appropriate candidate for SGLT2 inhibitor? This really is an important conversation. The patient with an estimated GFR less than 20 to 30 mLs per minute is not a candidate. The lower the candidacy is even more restricted. The patient with type 1 diabetes is not a candidate. The development of a non-GAP acidosis can be not only critical, but fatal. So one has to keep that in mind. On the lesser side, even though it's not truly lesser if the patient has this problem, but perineal infections because of glucose urea represent a big concern, a concern we previously had, particularly with canagal flows and has not been validated, that of distal digit amputation. That must have been a quirk in our trial, was not seen in any of the other studies. So I don't really make a big argument about that. 
but the perineal infections are important. The renal function is key and restricting this to type two diabetes in the diabetic patient is incredibly important. There's one other question that I think I'll squeeze in and that's a GLP-1 agonist. We know that when those drugs were studied uniquely in heart failure, there was actually a signal that wasn't just null, but it was going the wrong way. So appropriate for patients with ASCVD, another glucose lowering agent that appears to be beneficial, but not in the setting of heart failure. Are there any other questions? Dr. Yancey, uh, I have a question for you here. Um, you mentioned the, the prompts for advanced heart failure um, to identify patients. What strategies are, have you observed to identify these patients earlier in their disease progression? One of the things that we're doing here at Northwestern is uh, very provocative. Um, we have over time built a data science group. So as a university, we have an entity called NUDAT, N-U-D-A-T, um, led by really a, a brilliant uh, methodologist that understands machine learning and augmented intelligence, or artificial intelligence, depending on your preference there. But within cardiovascular medicine, we've built a group and we've established through a partnership with Northwestern University in Evanston in the engineering department, the first, we think, masters of science in artificial intelligence appropriate for physicians to access. We have a wait list for this and it's recurring. Um, it's a very rigorous program that starts with a pretty deep indoctrination and in pure mathematics. And then um, it's case-based with capstone projects. But one of the th reasons why I'm giving you this elucidation of what we've done is that one of our early applications has been to apply machine learning to our electronic health record. We have a very large electronic data warehouse, which is uploaded not only with information from our electronic health record, but all the digitized information from our diagnostic labs, including our imaging labs. So we've been able to use machine learning to get a very early glimpse at whom is it that has advanced heart failure and concurrently, whom is it that has new onset heart failure? So we've been able to identify that there's even more heart failure in our system than we thought, but getting to the patient with advanced disease early, anybody would validate how important that is. But machine learning has been our approach. But the I need help acronym is very, very important. An everyday clinician, when I'm in the office seeing patients, I can think of that I need help acronym. And if one of those comes up in my interview with a patient, that prompts a greater discussion about advanced therapists. Thank you. Um, any, any other, other questions online or in person? All right, well, just want to take the opportunity to thank you again, Dr. Yancey. This was, a, this was fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I think there's an important announcement for next week. So I am going to depart. Thank you for the invitation. And once again, pay homage to Dr. Burchell and the foundation that he prepared for you at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. Have a good day, everyone.